Hello, everybody. Welcome to Westpac's webinar on sterile barrier systems, common failure modes, and design recommendations. I'm Grape Swing Hammer, and I'll be your moderator and webinar organizer today. Before we get started, let's take a moment to ensure everyone is ready and familiar with the webinar control panel. First, you should have a control panel on the right side of your screen. You may minimize this panel by clicking the double arrow button in the upper left corner. You may expand the panel by clicking the same button. Second, we have the ability to submit, you have this ability to submit questions using the chat pane located near the bottom of the control panel. We will be answering a few questions at the end of each section. If we can't get to your question, someone from Westpac will follow up with you following the webinar. We will also be using the question asking tool during the webinar. Please raise your hand so we can make sure that this tool works. Great. Thank you for raising your hand, everybody. Let's get started. Today's presenters are Kevin Fernandez and Eric Lau. They are both our senior test engineers here at Westpac and have been with us since 2005. Kevin, take it away. So here's our agenda for this webinar. First, we will define a package system, protective packaging, and a sterile barrier system. We will briefly explain the different the different type of sterile barrier tests, the gross leak detection, also known as a bubble test or a bubble leak test, the dye penetration test, the seal strength test, also known as a peel test, and the burst test. Technically, seal strength and burst tests aren't really integrity tests per se, but they are related since low values with either test can lead to integrity breaches during distribution or distribution testing. We do a lot of this type of testing here at Westpac and we see our fair share of failures, so we're gonna go over some of the most common types of failure modes we see and provide some general design or redesign recommendations to correct these failures or to prevent them in the first place. We'll then wrap it up with some, some conclusions and try to answer any questions you may have, but as Greg pointed out, you folks watching have the, the opportunity to type questions you may have as um, we go along, so if you have any, feel free to type them out and we'll try to address them at the end of each section or um, at the end of the presentation um, if we have time. So let's get started. Um, let's define a package system per um, ISO 11607. It's a pretty simple definition. It's a combination of a sterile barrier system and the protective packaging. So what is that exactly? I'll try to explain using the different levels of a packaging system. So with the protective packaging, we have the shipper usually a corrugated fiberboard box. This is the actual packaging or the overpack that you'll be shipping your product in. Then the next level of packaging is contained within the shipper. This is your secondary package, your tertiary, quaternary packaging, however many levels of packaging you may have. Um, typically, this is some sort of folding carton or box, maybe even a bag. Then we have the primary package. This is the first level of packaging. This is the packaging that is in intimate contact with your product. For medical devices, this is typically your sterile barrier system, or SBS for short. This is usually the breathable pouch or tray that allows for sterilization, and this is what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, failure modes and general recommendations for sterile barrier system packaging. So um, SBS integrity tests. Um, these are deter to determine if the sterile barrier is maintained to ensure that the product is free from viable microorganisms. So it's pretty straightforward, and these tests are actually pretty simple, as you can see, or as you will see. The integrity tests are typically conducted after the distribution simulation, or a transit test, or a package performance test, whatever you want to call it. So it's after the sequence of drops, vibration, low pressure, concentrated impact, and whatnot to simulate the shipping and distribution environment. So these are the ASTM D4169, 7386, the ISTA2 standards like um, 2A, 3A, or your um, company specification or protocol. Um, we conduct the SBS tests after these package performance tests to ensure that the SBS is still intact. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna pass over the mic to Eric and he's gonna go over the most common type of SBS test, which is gross leak detection testing. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, we'd like to begin with the gross leak detection test. This test is conducted per ASTM F2096 and is used to find gross leaks in medical packaging through the use of internal pressurization. 
It's an extremely thorough method since it tests the entire package, including all the seals as well as the surfaces. We would first lower the package system one inch below the water surface, inflate the package system with internal pressure, and then finally inspect for any signs of gross leaks. The leaks are indicated by a steady stream of bubbles. The test is designed to find leaks as small as 125 micron. A common question we get asked is how the test pressure is determined. We would create a known failure on the package surface and slowly and steadily increase the internal pressure until the failure is detected. This gives you the minimum test pressure. Typically the test would be conducted at a slightly higher pressure to increase the chances of finding any punctures. Now the first failure mode for bubble testing is also one of the most common. This is stress cracking or sometimes referred to as flex cracking of the pouch material. The photo at the bottom left is an, is an example of stress cracking. If you look to the bottom right, this is how the failure would appear during the bubble test. The main cause of stress cracking is from compound folding. This generally results from using a pouch that is longer than needed. When using an excessively long pouch, this, you would need to fold the pouch before placing it into the carton or shipper. The folded areas of the pouch would get aggravated during distribution, which can lead to material cracking. Also, using a universal package configuration can also be the issue. By universal package, I mean using the same pouch size for differently sized products. It does seem like the easiest thing to do, but this can lead to stress cracking if you're required to fold the pouches. We recommend that you always do your best to use the proper pouch size to either eliminate or at least minimize the amount of folding. Or you can also try using a stronger, more flexible laminate material like a nylon laminate. Using the proper pouch size would definitely help avoid redesigns and maybe will even help your company save some money if you reduce the amount of pouch material used. The second failure mode we typically see are punctured surfaces caused by protruding objects. Always think about the distribution environment when you design your package. We've seen a lot of punctures that result from sharp objects going through trays from drop testing or even dull objects causing abrasion during vibration hazards. Our recommendations would be to use a device card such as a chipboard card with tabs. This would help hold your unit in place and restrict it from shifting too much. Try applying plastic covers over protruding objects or maybe even switch to a thermal form tray if your product has a lot of protruding or sharp parts. The third failure mode is tray cracking, which generally results from drop testing. If you use a tray material that is too stiff or improperly designed, like using an incorrect bend radius, this can cause weak points in your tray. Another possible cause is using an unreasonably high accelerated aging temperature. Using high aging temperatures can cause tray material transitions and degradation or weakening of the material. Our recommendations would be to redesign the tray with the help of your vendor. They can adjust the geometry of the tray or recommend other materials that are less stiff and more ductile, which would provide additional impact resistance. Make sure you check with your vendor for design and material options. Using a more expensive material might cost you more initially, but it'll help you save money from needing to redesign. Also make sure that the aging temperature is below the transition temperatures of your product and packaging. ASTM F1980, which is the accelerated aging specification, recommends using a temperature no higher than 60 degrees Celsius unless a higher temperature has been proven to be appropriate. We do have 65 degrees and sometimes six, 60 to 65 degrees Celsius chambers running at Westpac. So if you'd like a tour, we can show you how hot they are. The last gross leak detection test failure mode that we'd like to discuss is caused by sealing issues. As you can see on the pouch, the in-house seal has a lot of creases. This was most likely caused by folding of the material during the sealing process. There are a lot of times where we even see in-house seals that do not appear to have been sealed at all. Just doing a quick inspection of the seals would easily flag this. Another possible cause can result from the contents inside your pouch or tray. For example, the contents might be slightly protruding which could restrict proper sealing of the package. 
So just make sure that you always perform your design of experiments on your sealing parameters and processes. Check your sealing equipment to make sure that there is nothing blocking it from making a proper seal. And make sure to perform a quick visual inspection if possible. This concludes bubble testing. Greg, do we have any quick questions before we move on to dye penetration testing? Yes, uh, we have a question from Salvatore. Uh, if folding pouches is, what's the best way to fold the, um, let me see here. If you are folding pouches, is it better to have the clear film on the inside or the outside of the fold radius? One of you guys got that one? Eric, you got, Eric, you got that? So is it better to fold the film on the inside or the outside? Uh, typically, I would. We see a lot of pouch folding because generally, it's kind of hard to avoid. But a lot of the pouch folding we've seen, you fold it the poly side inside. If you fold it the other way around, it's there's more chance of the poly material rubbing against your carton, which would probably cause more aggregation and probably result in a failure on the poly side of the pouch. Tyvek's a little more stronger. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we do have one more question from Matthew. Uh, let's see here. What is considered an extreme aging temperature in excess of 45 degrees C? So um, when you choose your aging temperature, um, you want to know your packaging material and your product material. So you just want to ensure that you know the glass transition temperature of your material. Um, so anything higher than that, of course, will be excessive. But um, if you're at a temperature where um, it's below the glass transition temperature of your um, material, um, then you're pretty good. So it's only excessive if it's um, it's it's product dependent, pretty much. Yeah, check check with your supplier. Maybe your the supply the supplier of your materials. They probably have those properties of those materials. So you just make sure you don't exceed those temperatures during aging. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the questions, guys. And the ones we didn't get to, we'll follow up with you after the webinar. Uh, go ahead and continue with the next section. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Okay, so we'll talk about dye penetration testing. Dye penetration testing comes out of ASTM F1929 with the latest revision from 2012. This is for uh, detecting channel leaks in the seals of your pouch or tray, and um, the keyword here is seals. Unlike the bubble test, the dye penetration test only tests the seals of your package for sterile barrier breaches. Um, so if there are any breaches in the surface of your pouch or tray, you're not likely to find them with this method. Um, a question we get a lot is, which test should I do on my package, bubble testing or dye penetration testing? Um, if you have a choice between dye and bubble, we're always going to recommend bubble testing since it tests the entire package. Um, now, if you're just trying to validate your seals for your pouch or tray, um, say for an IQ, OQ, PQ, or something like that, then dye penetration would be a good choice. Otherwise, um, go for bubble testing. But back to dye penetration testing. Um, so this is a pretty simple test. The seals are exposed to a dye solution, and any channels or voids in the seals will show up as failures. Uh, the dye solution is made up of a coloring agent and a surfactant to lower the surface tension of the solution. So when the seals are exposed to the dye, the dye will force itself into any voids, um, exposing any channels or failures. Another question we get is, how subjective is this test? And I'd say if you have a true channel in your seal, a true failure, then it's not very subjective. You'll see it right away within the first second of um, exposing it to dye. Now, sometimes you have folds in your Tyvek, and when you expose the dye or the pouches to um, when you expose the pouches to the dye, the dye will follow the folds and wick through it, making it look like a channel in the seals. But these look totally different than a true channel, which is a pretty blatant. Um, yeah. So anyways, um, let's talk about the ASTM standard. So it gives you um, three different methods for um, running this test. With method A, it's the injection method. And this is where you puncture a hole in the pouch or tray and inject the dye solution in it and expose all of the seals to the dye. Uh, with this method, your product is going to be exposed to the dye, so if you don't want that, you can use methods B or C, or B and C. With method B, this is the edge dip method. This is where you dip the edge of your seal into the dye, and if there are any channels or voids, capillary action will force the dye into them, um, exposing them as failures. Um, for this to work, the dye must be in direct contact with the seal edge, 
So you can't use this method for pouch seals with fins, such as the in-house seal or the chevron seal. For these seals, you can use method C. Um, this is the eyedropper method. This is where you drop a uh, dye into the fins of the seals to expose the seals to the dye. So methods B and C are non-destructive. It allows you to do this test without having to breach your package um, and without exposing your product to the dye. Unless you have a failure, of course, then it'll show up, or then your product might get exposed to the dye. Um, but per the standard, all three methods work equally well. The, the best method to use for your particular package um, will depend on your package and product size, um, but all three methods are supposed to work equally well when applicable. So um, we don't see too many failures with dye penetration testing, um, but like I said, when we do, it's pretty distinct. It's a, usually a distinct channel in the seal, um, usually from a crease or fold along the seal that caused the material to separate in that area, or it might be a material defect there may, may be a defect in the material that caused it not to seal properly in certain areas, or it can even be from uneven sealing, um, either from equipment issues or from using the wrong seal parameters. Um, it may be difficult to determine the actual cause of the failure, um, so it would take some work on your part to find the actual root cause, but in any case, we recommend um, avoiding any sharp folds to pouches um, when they're packaged minimize any folding required by using the proper pouch size for your product. Obviously, excessive pouch length will require more folding within the package system, so it'd be best to try to avoid that. If it's a material defect issue, um, obviously, just inspect your material for consistency. If it's a sealing issue, check your sealing equipment for proper function and consistency. Um, it might have cold spots uh, in the sealing bar causing um, unsealed voids, um, and make sure you're using the proper sealing parameter um, to be sure that you have a strong enough seal. Another type of failure we see during dye penetration testing is from um, improper sealing. And again, we don't see it too often here, but when we do, it's pretty obvious. Um, with this type of failure, it's when the material was actually folded over during the sealing, which caused the channel um, during in the seal, um, as you can see uh, pictured here. So this could be a cause of a material defect the roll stock could have a crease or fold along the entire length of it causing this issue, or it might be from um, um, an improper sealing process. So I would recommend uh, um, inspecting the roll stock for consistency for any defects um, if it is a material issue. Um, also observe the sealing process. Uh, check to see if your operators are operating the sealing equipment properly. Make sure they're properly trained to use the equipment. Um, you can even add a brief inspection after sealing this could be as simple as uh, taking a look at the seal after it's been sealed to just make sure it looks good. Of course, visual inspection isn't always the best way of finding defects, but you'll at least be able to spot any um, obvious ones or gross ones. And with a defect like this, you should be able to spot it visually right away. Uh, so that's um, pretty much dye penetration. Um, Greg, do we have any questions in this area? We do. We have one from Abha. Uh, would the dye penetration test weaken the seals so that it may fail peel seal strength testing or reduce the peel strength? From what we've seen, um, the, the seals in a pouch or tray are, they're, they're, they're supposed to be mechanical, but they're somewhat chemical, I guess, also. Um, so as long as you're running the peel test after the dye has dried, it shouldn't affect your your um, peel test results, or it shouldn't affect it significantly. Do we have any other questions? Uh, no, that's only the only question for this section. If you guys have other questions on this section, again, please submit them, and we will follow up with you after the webinar. So go ahead and take it away, Eric. All right, Eric here. The next test method is the seal strength test. This test is condu conducted per ASTM F88 and is used to measure the seal strength of packaged seals. There are three methods described in the F88 test specification, which are method A, unsupported. This is the most commonly requested method and generally results in consistent data. Method B, 90 degree supported, which is the least used method as it introduces human factors. See the hand? And method C, 180 degree with vacuum plate. This method is also commonly used 
and vendors generally suggest this method since they believe it provides the most consistent data. Now, method C results in higher seal strength results than method A. The results of method C are generally at least 1.5 times higher than the seal strength compared to using method A. But like I've mentioned earlier, both method methods do provide consistent data. We always get asked which method is better. Our advice is to just keep the test method consistent. That way, all your data would be comparable to your previous testing. Remember to check previous testing and ask your vendor which method they use for validating their seals. Our first failure mode for PL strength testing is seal strength less than one pound force per inch. Can everyone give us a quick show of hands for how many of you have had this issue? I'll give you guys a few moments to answer. So while the poll results come in, we'd just like to thank you all for attending the webinar today. Um, we still have the people raise your hands if you have this, if you know about the one pound force. It looks like we have about 20% uh, of the folks are using the one pound force. All right, thanks Greg, that's about what we're expecting. So we always get asked where the one pound force per inch came from. This actually is not an industry standard, and in fact there actually is no industry standard. One pound force per inch is just an arbitrary number that a lot of people use since there's no standard to follow. If your current package system can get away with lower peel values and still maintain its sterile integrity, this should, your sealing parameters should be sufficient. We generally see protocols with passing criteria starting from about 0.75 to 1 pound force per inch. But if lower seal strength does interfere with your package integrity, this can normally be fixed by adjusting your sealing parameters to provide a stronger seal. The second failure mode for peel testing is the cohesive failure. For a pouch or tray being peeled open, a desired peel is an adhesive peel. This is where the two sides of the SBS are cleanly separated at the adhesive. The diagrams at the top left illustrates an adhesive peel. The bottom left diagram, the bottom left diagram illustrates a cohesive peel, where the material, typically the Tyvek, starts to tear. This is the result of oversealing. The picture on the bottom right shows an actual cohesive failure where the Tyvek begins to tear. All right, so when is this really an issue? If your package is a pouch and the vendor seals peel cleanly, this is generally okay. Nurses typically use the aseptic transfer technique to transfer the pouch contents, and the in-house seal is almost never peeled at all. Note that the in-house seal is highlighted by the red dotted line. As long as the vendor seals peel cleanly, this should be fine. However, on the right, tray seals are always required to result in clean adhesive peels. Cohesive failure peels on a tray will cause the lid material to begin tearing, which would make the tray really hard to open. Not only that, but the particulates from the material tearing can also cause sterility issues. Just imagine trying to open one of these pouches in an operating room. If cohesive peel failures are an issue, try adjusting the sealing parameters, such as lowering the sealing duration or temperature so that oversealing does not occur. Greg, do we have any questions on peel testing? Um, we have one question. It's what is the risk of a cohesive peel? What is the likelihood of it? Do you guys have any opinion on that? Kevin? Um, I don't I don't have a exact metrics on the likelihood of it, but if your sealing param parameters are incorrect, um, usually if um, you're oversealed, you would get a um, cohesive failure. Um, but we actually see it pretty often here. Um, like Eric said, we usually see it in the in-house seal, um, and that's because usually um, the in-house seal, when you guys do it in-house, it's not in control as well as it is um, at the manufacturer. Um, but it's hard to say exactly uh, what the likelihood is, but we see it often. And as long as you have your param parameters correct and your seals aren't oversealed, then you should be good. Yeah, one suggestion would probably be to ask your vendor what sealing parameters they're sealing with. Maybe if you have the same sort of sealing equipment, try using those parameters to start out with. Um, cohesive failures are typically caused by oversealing, so maybe you're using too high of a pressure or a temperature, so it can generally be easily fixed. But, uh, okay, 
Great, guys. Um, we have a lot of other questions, but let's continue on so we can make sure we can get through all the presentation. If we have time at the end, we'll go ahead and answer some more of the questions. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. So our final test method is the burst test. This is conducted per ASTM F1140 and F2054. These are the unrestrained and restrained test methods. Uh, these methods are used to evaluate tendencies for package failure when exposed to pressure differentials. Uh, pressure di differentials that typically occur during processes like sterilization or transportation. During burst testing, your package should not result in a consistent failure location. Low burst values, which typically occur at a consistent location, would mean that this seal area is most likely the weakest seal of your package. This can mean that the area of the package could be incorrectly sealed or undersealed. Our recommendations would be to adjust the sealing parameters as needed and to check the sealing equipment for signs of uneven sealing. For example, your pouch sealer might have some cold spots or your tray sealers might need to be leveled to pro provide a more even seal. That wraps up what we'd like to talk about today. Greg, do we have any questions before we conclude? Um, the questions we do have, I think, require a little bit more follow-up and uh, in-depth discussion with the folks. So we'll go ahead and hold off on those and get back to them on a one-to-one -one basis. But it uh, looks great so far, guys, so why don't you go ahead and run through the conclusions. All right, so um, some final thoughts. Uh, so these are just some of the common failure types we see here at Westpac in regards to SBS testing. Again, we see our fair share of failures, and these are just some uh, um, general recommendations for correcting these failures or preventing them in the first place. Hopefully a, a good starting point for you folks. After going through these different common failure types, it would seem apparent that the key to maintaining a good sterile barrier system is by using the proper material and design and using the correct seal, sealing parameters and sealing method. Um, if you get these things right, you should have a pretty good SBS that should be able to maintain sterility throughout distribution. Um, when you do, do testing at Westpac, we always try to help by providing recommendations and help if needed or help where we can. Um, but if issues arise, you should always consult your supplier for different material and packaging options. Uh, they should know their own material better than anyone else. So work closely with them to create the package with the performance characteristics that you need. Um, so that pretty much wraps up our presentation. Um, if there are any other questions we could try to answer, we could um, we could try to do that right now. Greg? Uh, we do have one question from Salvatore. Uh, does Westpac use one type of burst tester, or what type of burst pet tester does Westpac use? Uh, yes, we have. Um, we use one type of burst tester here. It's a pretty standard one. Um, there are two different methods, as Eric um, pointed out. So. For this one burst tester, sometimes we would use um, a, f a fixture for it, and sometimes we won't use a fixture for it. So we have different fixtures of running the test depending on the package. But um, but yeah, we just have a one type of burst tester here. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, the questions are coming in now. Uh, we'll go ahead and follow up after the webinar with you guys. Thanks for all the questions. Um, Okay, so Eric and Kevin, thanks for the presentation. If you missed anything or would like to listen to the webinar again, please check Westpac's website at www.westpac.com under the Events tab. The webinar should be uploaded there by Monday. Check our website under the Upcoming Events tab for our next webinar. If there are any other questions you'd like to answer, please email them to projects at westpac.com. And also, if you'd like to see any other webinars presented or provided by Westpac, please email them to projects at westpac.com. We will be sending out a survey following this webinar. Please fill it out as we are always to looking to improve our process. Thank you for attending the webinar. I'm Greg Swinghammer. Make it a great day.